Hello everyone, uh, welcome to week 9. Today we're going to talk about energy and metabolism. Um, we're going to talk about how energy moves and reactions and then we'll translate it to next week to cellular respiration. Okay, So let's start with a little bit about energy, could be some physics, some chemistry. So talking about metabolism, metabolism would be the total of all of the chemical reactions carried out in an organism so in organism so everything we're breaking down that will be the metabolism so it's the total of all chemical reactions so every time we eat um every time we break down different substances in our body we are um, going through chemical reactions we're breaking stuff down we're creating other stuff so all of that the total of all of that would be our metabolism so there's two types of reactions we have anabolic reaction anabolic uh, and we have catabolic reactions, okay? So anabolic reactions, they use energy to build molecules, okay? So that's why people have anabolic steroids. They shouldn't, but big baseball player, it's big in baseball, it was. Um, and you have catabolic, which would be, sorry, I wrote it down again, um, but they would release energy uh, by breaking down, Ooh, breaking down molecules. Okay, so an anabolic reaction will make something. A catabolic uh, reaction uh, will break something down. Okay, so those are the two types of reactions that we have. Okay, so think about every time we're digesting food, are we building stuff or are we breaking stuff down? Um, that would just be one example. Okay. Um, so let's see if I can write down an example here. Um, so I want to write this down. I don't think I could write a, a word. So I'll go ahead and write it here. So we have, um, in anabolic reactions, we have A plus B. This is too slow. Um, equals A. This is horrible. I'm going to write it down over here. Okay, uh, let's see if this is better. A plus B equals AB. So that's, uh, that's anabolic, where you get two of them and you create one. On the other hand, in catabolic, you have AB would equal A plus B. Okay, so when you break down, um, when you use energy. So this one, you use energy to build the molecule. This one, you uh, release energy by breaking down. Remember, a lot of energy is stored in those bonds, those covalent bonds, those ionic bonds, those hydrogen bonds. So for energy is there. Once you break that bond out, down, then you release energy. Okay, so now let's talk about biochemical pathways, okay, or metabolic pathways or pathways for... Um, of chemical reactions, so we have biochemical pathways, or we can call this metabolic. Okay, um, so these path biomedical biochemical pathways are multi step chemical reactions. Okay, multi step chemical reactions, so it's just a reaction that has many, many steps that's going through. Okay, um, reactions occur in a sequence, so that means it's step by step. It's not just whatever happens. You know, it's 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 a step by step process. Um, the product of one reaction is a substrate, a reactant of the next. So substrate equals reactant. So substrate and reactant is just whatever you're gonna use or whatever you're gonna break down. So when we get food. Say I don't need a pizza, the pizza would be the substrate or the chemicals inside the pizza that made up the pizza, that would be our substrate. So you can break it down a little bit. So we'll say in terms of reactions, cellular respiration, we talk about glucose. Glucose would be the substrate that would break down. Then we break down the C6, H12O6 into um, a three carbon um, molecule. And then that three carbon break it down into individuals so or like that. So it's just the substrate or the reactant that we're breaking down or we're using. And enzymes are required at each state. Okay. 
requires n times. So what were these n times? We're going to talk a little bit um, later on about n times, but just those things that help out uh, with the chemical reactions and help uh, require less energy. Okay. Um, so here's an example. Um, you can have an initial substrate, like I said, here on the top. And then you go through enzyme one, break it down a little bit, and now this the product of that would be this other substrate, break it down more, then that product would be this one, break it down more, and then end up with your end product at the end. So it's a multi-step uh, process, okay? So some examples, uh, we have cellular respiration and photosynthesis, okay? Um, we have glucose, um, oxygen, um, and then we make some CO2 or some water. So those are our two uh, biggest examples of those biochemical pathways, which we're going to focus on, on on these next couple of weeks. Okay, now let's jump into energy. Okay, energy just means the capacity to do work. So sometimes we need a lot of energy because we don't want to do any work. We don't want to do our labs. We don't want to do our, our, um, our discussion posts. Uh, I know you guys do, but um, so we need energy uh, to do some work. Okay, so the capacity to do work. So we have two types of energy. Uh, we have kinetic, kinetic, and we have potential energy. Okay, so kinetic is energy in motion. I don't know if you remember this from. Physics, if you did take it, if not, it's okay. We're not going to get too in detail, but um, kinetic is energy that's already moving, and potential is energy that's stored that may be used later on. So, stored energy. So, kind of like in those bonds that I was telling you. Um, so, every time you have these bonds and the molecules stuck together, um, that would be some potential energy. Once you break it down, the energy would be used, and that would be kinetic energy. Okay, energy in motion. So, I don't know if you noticed, but this whole um, topic of energy has a lot of definitions, okay? So it's kind of like uh, last week. So it's a lot of definitions, so make sure you write these down. Uh, feel free to take some pictures of the uh, video as well, but we have a lot of definitions going on here, okay? So here's a, an example of potential and kinetic. It's a little girl on the swing. Um, she's on top, she has a lot of potential to slide down. So when she's up here, that's potential energy. When she's already sliding down, that would be kinetic energy, okay? So energy stored, energy in motion, potential, kinetic, okay? Um, now, um, <clears throat> so we can talk about photosynthesis a little bit. Synthesis a little bit, okay? So photosynthesis is how plants are gonna use energy from the sun energy from the sun um, to create um, oxygen and glucose. Okay, So plants use that energy from the sun. So if the energy in the sun is just chilling there waiting to be used, and that would be potential, right? Once they take it, once they use it, that would be kinetic energy. Okay, um, So those photosynthetic organisms or those plants, they're able to capture this energy store it in the bonds of glucose for us to use later on. That's kind of crazy. So they're able to grab the energy from the sun and then somehow make some molecules or some food and store that energy in those bonds that are holding these molecules. So when we eat that apple or when we eat that fruit or vegetable, we can get the energy from those bonds that came from the sun. Whoa, it's pretty crazy, huh? Um, so yeah, so that's how that works. Um, so photosynthesis, those plants use that energy from the sun to create oxygen and glucose. Um, energy is stored in covalent bonds. Okay. I think that was pretty crazy. At least for me, it's pretty mind-blowing some of these things that we're learning. Okay, um, so that's photosynthesis. Cellular respiration would be the other way. Um, all right, so we'd be um, in photosynthesis, you get that energy and you use the energy um, 
in uh, cellular respiration, we break down the bonds to use the energy. Okay, so photosynthesis bring the energy, and so rest we break it down and we use the energy. Okay. Um, now let's jump into the laws of thermodynamics again. These are just a couple of definitions, and they're important for you to learn them right now for the next topics of cell rest and photosynthesis. Okay, so that's why I'm laying out a, a foundation and all this. So we have the laws of thermodynamics. Um, we're really just going to focus on the first two. So we got the first law. Uh, which just says energy. I don't remember this, but let me see. Let me make this a little bit. Cool. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Right? Energy can't be created or restored. It's just recycled, reused, transferred to different areas. Okay? Energy can change form from one form to another. Um, the total amount of energy in the universe. Uh, it remains constant, so it's the same amount everywhere. We're just using it and moving it around. And some energy is lost by uh, as heat. Okay, so every time we have this, um, this chemical reaction and we produce heat, we're losing the energy. It's going somewhere else. Um, that's one of the biggest ways. So every time we're making a fire, you're losing some energy on those those bonds or whatever you're burning, whatever you're using down there. Okay. And that carne asada. All right. Cool. So now, um, that was the first law. Let me a little bit. And we have the second law. Uh, so that just means um, entropy is continuously increasing. So chaos is continuously happening. Disorder is continuously ha happening. So entropy is just disorder or chaos, how things are just moving around and, and reactions are happening and all these things are transforming and moving. So we have um, energy transformations. Transformations uh, convert matter from a from a ordered form to a less ordered form. From a more ordered form, there is. Okay. So here's a quick um, example. Um, here's a room, nice and clean. Those who that have kids may understand. I don't have any kids yet, but it's still pretty messy. Um, and all of a sudden, this disorder happens spontaneously. I don't know how, but the room gets all mixed up and clothes are everywhere. And everyone has a mas magical chair that they have there in the room that just use it to store somewhat clean clothes. But you don't want to wear clothes and you just leave the clothes there. You got to wash them again. Anyways, so this chaos occurred out of nowhere. Um, so as transformations, as you're moving, as you're walking, as you're changing, you're creating this disorder or this chaos. Uh, and then you need some organization and some energy to put this chaos back together into this nice and clean little room. Or you can pay someone. Okay. But, um, but it does require some energy and organization to clean all of this and bring it back to normal, to order, to disorder, to order, to disorder. Okay. So that's the second uh, law. So hmm. here's an example. Um, I want to talk about two big... Uh, words okay so we have um we're gonna talk about reactions now okay jump into those reactions and use a little bit of these terms so we're gonna talk about endergonic and exergonic so what does that even mean anybody heard of that word so endergonic endergonic reactions um Okay, um, so we have here our reactants, and then we have, here's a little chart. I will, I'll probably put these in an email and send you all these images, because these are really helpful. So in an endergonic reaction, we have these reactants, and you add some energy to create these products. Okay, so remember, anabolic, um, you need some energy to create a molecule. So... Um, that's an endergonic. So when you have, on the other hand, exergonic is when you have these reactants and you go through these reactions 
and you create these products, but you release energy, so exit. So I just remember ender, enter energy, exer, exit energy, okay? Endergonic and exergonic. So, um, uh, let's be supply, okay? So for example, anabolic reaction, um, cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Which one uh, breaks down to create energy and which one um, uses energy to create products? So remember, an ener endergonic energy must be supplied so to create something. So remember, uh, during photosynthesis, um, energy is being supplied to create these molecules, okay? Um, on the other hand, exergonic energy oh, energy is released. Um, we can talk about catabolic reaction. When you have a, um, a B and you break it down, and you get A plus B with some energy from that bond. Or you can talk about cellular respiration okay um, so those are the two the endergonic enter exergonic exit so question would an anabolic reaction be endergonic or exergonic uh, you have it in your notes anabolic reaction would be endergonic it requires energy input to make molecules okay um, so that's that. <clears throat> okay, cool, 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 cool. Uh, photosynthesis, cellular respiration. Again, we're gonna, these are just terms, definitions that we're gonna use the next couple of weeks. Okay, so it's important to lay that foundation down. Make sure we have these terms down. Now, we're gonna talk about activation energy. Activation again with my spelling. So activation energy is energy required to destabilize existing bonds and initiate a chemical reaction. So I'll go ahead and type in the whole scientific definition. Um, but technically, it's how much energy is needed to start. Uh, to activate a reaction or to start a reaction. So that's the activation energy. So how much energy you need to push that little girl from the slide, not off a cliff or anything like that, from the slide from the picture we had. Okay, so get that potential energy into kinetic energy. So how much energy you need to start that. That's the activation or to activate it, the activation energy. Okay. Um, let me through my notes. I take notes too. Now, um, so we have ah, okay, so we have something that's called catalysts, okay, and those catalysts are enzymes. I think we wrote it down up here. Um, catabolic reactions, or oh, maybe we did it. Maybe I got ahead of myself. Okay, so we have what's called catalysts. So those catalysts are enzymes. Those enzymes are the ones that are gonna drive those um, reactions. Remember, um, catalysts, uh, they lower the amount of activation energy needed, okay? So those are those enzymes. So here's a, a really cool example. Again, I'm gonna get these images and send them to you, but so you have this whole reaction here. We have our reactants, we have our products. Now, um, if you don't have a catalyst, this is how much energy, so this is the energy released right on the left over here on our y-axis, energy. So if you don't have a catalyst, that would be blue, you need all this energy to break down, to create a product, okay? So all of this. If you do have a catalyst, you need less energy, okay? So you have something that's really helping it out and therefore you're gonna need less energy to go through that chemical reaction and create your product. Okay, so that's really the biggest, um, the biggest thing. Those catalysts help um, decrease the amount of energy needed for that reaction to take place. Okay, that's a good picture. <clears throat> so here's enzymes or catalysts, the same thing, and they decrease the amount of energy required to start a chemical reaction. Those are our catalysts. 
Right. Mm. Now we have something what's called redox reaction. So we're almost done. Redox reactions. There are two types of redox reactions. We have oxidation and reduction. Okay, so during an oxidation reaction, it's called so redox reaction or oxidation reaction. Um, there's a loss of electrons. During a reduction reaction, there is a gain of electrons, which sounds kind of when you reduce, you gain. Sounds kind of funky, but that's how it is. So the way I remember it is, um, I use a term called. I don't know if anybody remembers, but oil rig, okay? So oxidation is loss, that's how I remember. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain, oil rig. Um, there's also a term where you could say um, Leo Ger. That would be the other one. I mean, what's going on right now? Um, Leo goes Ger, or the lion goes Ger. I don't know, I like the oil rig better. Um, so loss of electrons is oxidation, gain of electrons is reduction. Okay, so those are the words. Um, so you can see any of those. That's just to remind you that during an oxidation reaction, there's a loss of electrons, and during a reduction reaction, there is a gain of electron. Um, they are always paired. Okay. Um, redox. Redox. Reactions. Are always okay. So one occurs with the other one. They both occur uh, together. It's not one or the other. They both occur together, just in different parts of the reaction itself. Okay. Um, all right. So here's an example. Um, remember how we did all these bonds? How we talked about this? Um, you can say you have sodium on the left or chlorine. Um, that there's a transfer of that electron. So then this A. A plus um, is the one that, since it, remember it's an anormal, since it lost an electron, remember ions and what we learned, what was it like week two or week one? Feels like a long time ago. Um, you gained a, they lost an electron, therefore the sign is positive because there's more protons and electrons. On the other hand, so that, on the other hand, you have the B here, which is normal again, but it gained an electron, so the sign is negative, right? So A lost an electron, so it became positive, that's oxidation, and B gained an electron, that's negative, which is a reduction, okay? Um, why is this important? Because we'll talk about in cellular respiration, a little bit about this gaining or losing of electrons, but just know the term itself of oxidation and reduction, okay? Um, the biggest example that we have is ATP, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, okay, so we have ATP, ATP, okay, adenosine triphosphate means uh, you have adenosine plus a phosphate plus a phosphate plus a phosphate, so there's three P's in there, okay. We say adenosine diphosphate, that means there's only two P's. We say adenosine monophosphate is only one P. Okay, so every time you're adding a phosphate, um, that's ATP. So ATP, the energy that we use is in the form of adenosine plus the three phosphates. Okay, um, now let me see if there's an example here. Um, actually, I'll write down so we don't forget the word itself adenosine. Triphosphate. It's on caps. Oops. C triphosphate. All right. So it's the energy we use in all of our cells. Um, so this is a pretty chemical example. Remember, we have our ribose here um, from um, RNA. We have our ribose here. And then, um, so we got our, our sugar, we have our base. Um, adenine and ribose, adenosine, and then here's a one phosphate, second phosphate, third phosphate. So adenosine 
triphosphate. Those are the three phosphates. So this is your picture of ATP. So every time you need some energy, get it in ATP. Okay. Um, now, um, ATP, we have a term called, okay, so every time there's a P that's added or a P is released, phos, there's a term called phosphorylation. Ooh, pretty fancy. That just means uh, phosphate or transfer of phosphate between molecules. Okay, so you're just adding or removing a phosphate, phosphorylation, it's the biggest definition. Now, um, we have what's called the ATP hydrolysis, okay? The ATP hydrolysis, it drives endergonic reactions. Ender, energy enters, so endergonic, so energy enters, and you have ATP um, hydrolysis that drives those endergonic uh, reactions. Now, ATP, another thing, is ATP is not suitable for long-term storage. So really don't store the ATP. The ATP that create every day, we use it every day. That's when we have these carbs or these lipids. That's where energy is stored, but not really as an ATP itself just being stored, okay? Um, fats and carbohydrates are better for storing the energy themselves, the cells, only store the ATP a couple seconds and then they need some more. They really don't store ATP just chilling around in the cell itself. Okay. Um, now, uh, we're almost done. We're almost done. Uh, I think it's the last term. So, we'll talk about um, another definition. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, so, we talked about enzymes um, or catalysts. If you remember, but specifically, we're going to talk about proteins. Okay, um, so these proteins are the ones that are going to break down all the stuff inside of our body, all those, all those molecules inside of our body. Okay, so we're specifically talking about proteins here. Now, um, the enzymes or the proteins. Uh, let's see if I can do it here. I'll write it down here. Um, they lower the activation energy, so we talked about that earlier. Um, they reduce the amount of energy needed to start a reaction, so they lower the activation energy. And they are very substrate specific. Okay, they're very substrate specific. Very substrate specific. Substrate is reactant, remember? Um, so what does this mean is that the protein itself is very specific to the molecule that it's going to break down. It's very, very specific. They don't just go in there and break whatever. They're very specific. So here's a picture, um, a cool picture. So we have this um, enzyme here. Um, so this whole thing is our enzyme. The active site is just the area where the bonding or the connection or the breaking down is going to take place. And this is our substrate or our reactant, okay? So the enzyme is here on the left, and the enzyme substrate complex, fancy words, is just the enzyme with the substrate, enzyme substrate complex, okay? So see how specific or the shape it is, um, and that's how that's gonna be, so let me erase this real quick. Yeah, there it is. So see how specific this shape is, and that's how specific this one's gonna be as well. So it fits perfectly where it's supposed to go. Okay, so they're very substrate specific, okay? Um, the active site is really just this area here. Um, I don't think we need all these definitions, um, but it's really just the pocket for where they bind. Um, that's where they create the enzyme substrate complex. Again, it sounds fancy, but it's just this enzyme and the substrate put together. Uh, precise fit into the active site. Um, um, so it applies stress to distort the bond to lower the activation energy. Okay, so it helps breaking down that bond. So you need less energy. And by applying stress, you're really breaking down the bond itself. Okay, so let's see if there's an image here. Here it is. Awesome. So you have here our substrate. Uh, in this example, we have sucrose. Okay, 
use an example. So this whole thing is sucrose. Remember, sucrose is glucose and fructose. You probably already knew that, being the best students. Here's our enzyme. Which one's our active site? Just the area where things are going to happen in here. Okay. So the enzyme grabs that substrate, bond, binds it in specifically. Some water can come in here and help break down that reaction. The enzyme is going to be here as well. Um, now the binding of the substrate to the enzyme is going to cause some stress, some movement, and you're going to break this bond that was in the middle. Now you can release both products separately, which is what we want. The, slow, the smaller they are, the easier to digest, get the energy, get everything we want. And your enzyme comes out here again, and then it goes out and goes find another substrate and break it down and then come back again and go find another substrate. So that's its whole job. Go through the cycle, breaking the substrate uh, down. Okay, so it's very specific substrate specific the shape itself is very specific now um, these enzymes so here's a definition so let me write it down enzyme function um, the rate of the reaction depends on the concentration of substrates and enzyme Think about that, that's pretty uh, obvious. So the rate of the reaction or how fast or how slow the reaction occurs depends on the concentration or the amount of substrates and enzymes. So we have a lot of enzymes, you're gonna break down a lot of substrates. So therefore the rate is gonna be really, really fast. If you don't have a lot of enzymes and you have a lot of substrate, it's gonna be pretty slow because uh, each enzyme has to go and do double the work and break down everything. So it's a slower reaction rate. Now, these reaction rates can be influenced or changed um, due to temperature or pH. We already kind of talked about how uh, you can denature the proteins. Remember from a couple of weeks ago, uh, the temperature and the pH can really change the proteins, can change the shape, and changing the shape can change everything completely. Um, so temperature and pH can uh, alter the shape. So remember, since they're so shape-specific, Changing temperature, changing pH can shift that shape, and now it can bind to that substrate. Think of the substrate as a triangle, and then the shape can be changed because of the low temperature as a circle. It doesn't really fit in there, okay? Because it's very specific. Um, and here's an, an example: um, temperature of the reaction, the pH um, of the rate of reaction. So this is the optimum temperature for the human enzyme over here. The temperature changes, pH changes. Um, you can you can really change uh, the re the rate of the reaction itself. Okay. Uh, now we have to finish off. We have what's called inhibitors. Inhibitors. So we have um, competitive and non-competitive. So these inhibitors inhibit or stop the reaction or the substrate from joining that enzyme and being broken down. Okay, so there's some things that we really want to break down, but there's also some things that we want to break down later on, um, some reactions that we ha want to occur slowly and through time and not as quickly. So therefore we can add some inhibitors to kind of get stuck in there and, and interfere with the connection of the enzyme and the substrate. Okay, so here's an example of a competitive inhibition. So competitive just means um, that it fights um, in the active site. Okay, so here it competes with the substrate for the active site. So competes on the active site. Non-competitive non -competitive is attached on outside the active site. Okay, so attaches outside of the active site changing the shape so it really changes the shape a little bit um, see how this one's more squared here on the live so this inhibitor is really going to jump in there and not let this one substrate bind to it so it can't bind that's competitive it's competing with it 
non-competitive is it will attach on the on another area on the side on the bottom and change this shape so now that shape of a circle here doesn't fit with the shape of the square here since it doesn't fit it won't be able to break down that reaction okay so it changes the shape of the of the um, enzyme itself all right a lot of definitions and that's fine they may be confusing but we can go over them in class on Wednesday so I'll go ahead and take these images and make a and send you a message with the images so you can, they can help you study better and help you understand uh, the processes and the definitions a little better Adios.